Thank you very much. Um, can you all hear me okay at the back? Is this microphone on? Okay, so um, well, we'll get some slides up. Oh, yeah. That's not my one. Fantastic, thank you very much. So I'm going to talk for about half an hour about the, um, the River Otter beaver trial and some of the, some of the preliminary findings from that. Um, but I'm also going to talk a little bit about the enclosed project that we've been running. So the, the map here of the southwest of England shows the River Otter beaver trial area over on the, the right hand side there. But since 2011, we've also been running uh, an enclosed project over, you can see the other little red dot in the Tomar catchment. And although I'm not going to talk too much about that, I will just, uh, I'll just refer to that in a few places to show a sequence of slides from it. But this is what the site looks like. So it's a fenced site. It's about three hectares in size. Um, and we put a pair of beavers into there in March 2011 and began a, a detailed program of research and monitoring. Okay, so River Otter Beaver Trial, um, it's the first licensed uh, trial release of beavers into the wild in England. It resulted from animals being discovered living wild on the river already, so it looks like they've been on the river since about 2007, 2008. Um, but they came to light properly in about 2013, um, when somebody captured some footage of them breeding on the river, and at that point the government got involved and proposed to round up the animals and bring them into captivity. Um, and the local community were really, at that point, very attached to their beavers and fought that quite hard. And Devon Wildlife Trust intervened at that point and submitted a license to run a five-year trial. We felt it was too good an opportunity to miss, um, to study the impact of these wild living beavers in a real-world situation. And surprisingly, we were granted that license. Um, and so that license um, was for the act of re-releasing those beavers once they've been shown to be healthy. Um, and it was for a five-year trial. It covers the entire River Otter catchment, so the animals are free to roam anywhere within the catchment, but they're not permitted to move into any of the adjacent catchments. And if they do, then we have to go and retrieve them. Um, there is a monitoring plan in place attached to the license that's overseen by a science and evidence forum. And there's also a management strategy in place that outlines how we will deal with conflicts during the trial period. And then at the end of the trial, next year, Natural England or DEFRA will decide what happens next. So one of the, one of the conditions of the, of the trial is that the um, that animals have to be tagged. So as well as having pit tags, they also have these ear tags, which allow us to identify and monitor individual animals. But actually what we've found is a much more successful way of understanding what the population is doing within the catchment is an annual mapping of field sites. So we carry out a systematic survey of all of those parts of the catchment where the beavers have been active, and we map these sort of field sites. So this is typical um, the coppice willow next to the, uh, next to the water. And we, this is quite a long process. It takes us something in the region of 40 or 50 days every year but it means that we get a really nice picture of what the beavers are doing within the catchment in any one time. So this is the catchment, it's 250 square kilometers, so it's a good sized catchment. Um, it's about 50 kilometers from the top of the river to the bottom. Um, and this is what the population was doing at the very beginning of the trial. So we had these two family groups living wild <coughs> within the lower part of the catchment. They've chosen the deeper uh, water of the lower reaches to settle initially um, and as you can see they are they're living in two distinct groups but over quite a long <coughs> length of the river. The following winter, so by March 2016, we were up to three family groups. Um, so you can see there's another family that's established themselves about halfway up the river catchment. But the other thing to notice is our other feeding signs right the way up in the headwaters. So this is 50 kilometers up from where the original family group were living, really. Now, they weren't um, resident up there. What appeared to be happening was that the animals were exploring this relatively empty catchment, and they were having a bit of a nibble, a bit of a feed, and then coming back down again. And so you would find these uh, very occasional feeding signs almost anywhere within the catchment. So wherever we were looking, we were finding just occasional signs 
and they, they increased as well. Um, and in 2017, we also reinforced, or in 2016, late 2016, we reinforced the population with an additional pair um, in order to break up some of the genetic inbreeding. And so that little white, uh, the little yellow dot on the top left hand side is where we introduced that additional pair to. So by this point, we reckon we've got six family groups living throughout the catchment. By 2018, we've now got eight areas of activity, um, with six pairs that we know have had kits the previous year. And the most recent survey carried out last winter indicated 13 areas of activity. Now, we're really not saying that these are firm territories. Some of these could be individual animals, they could be um, animals that are moving between different areas of the catchment, but we think we've got about 13 areas that we could identify as where animals are generally living, with seven pairs that we know of, of raised kits successfully in the previous year. So that's where we are um, at the moment. So the population is definitely thriving, it's breeding very successfully. We've had one female animal that's been kicking out four or five kits a year for the last three years, and survival rates do seem to be really high. <coughs> so one of the first recommendations that we're making is that beaver management decisions need to be made at the catchment scale, based on an understanding of the ecology and the zoology of the species. So this movement of animals throughout a relatively empty catchment, where they're not constrained by other territories, is really important. And you'll find this in any river catchment where, where beavers are established. They really will be exploring those areas, even where they're not resident. As a, there's an expression that's becoming quite useful and quite relevant, better the beaver you know, which is, refers to if you are managing conflicts with, um, with beavers within an area, if you've got a relatively um, high population density and you remove beavers, either by lethal control or by trapping, that empty territory will quickly be recolonized by other beavers. So if you're removing beavers, that will be an ongoing process. And if you can live with those beavers, and you can manage those conflicts, then it means that you're not having incoming beavers actually trying to make their mark on their new area. So it's better to live with the beavers that you've got rather than create these vacuums. We're also, and this is quite specific to the river catchment, so, um, but we're, we're looking at the way the population is establishing and growing. So this, this red line is a rough indication of how we would expect a population in a catchment to grow. And the first um, few years of that growth is, the, is what we would call the establishment phase. And this is when population is still quite vulnerable to, to major shocks and would certainly be vulnerable to major losses. <laughs> Uh, at this point. It's also where there's a lot of education work required, um, a huge amount of interest in what's going on in the catchment. Um, but in terms of impacts, um, both positive and negative, it's relatively low level. You then go through this period of this building phase where the population is expanding rapidly, moving into new areas, having lots of positive impacts, but also creating quite a lot of conflicts as well. And so the need for management dramatically increases during this period. And then if you get to that stage, you get a levelling off where the population stabilises and often falls back down again. And at this point, your human population, your stakeholders, are becoming much more accepting or understanding of living alongside beavers. And so the need for really proactive education and management reduces. It becomes more normalised. So, um, so that's, what, that's the sort of model that we're suggesting that we apply to the River Otter for the next 10 years, so we're just moving into what we think is the building phase now. Okay, now beavers are most well known for building dams, and we've had over 80 dams now constructed in the River Otter catchment, but most of those dams are temporary and in existing wetlands, so like this low um, earth bank here, um, and I could probably only take you to nine dams that are currently in place on the catchment. So they really are coming and going all the time. They are by no means permanent features. Um, we've had three that are in a low energy drainage channel. So this is one of them. Just down in the foreground here, you can see the dam, and you can see the, the ditch running off to the left there. And that water level has come out and spilled out onto the field. And so there's a low level 
uh, retaining bun as well that sort of retains the water in that pool. But um, these tend to be much more permanent structures, these ones in the, in the drainage network. And the impact they have is obviously impounding water, and that's where you get your impacts on land drainage. Um, and so we've, we've got about uh, two and a half kilometres of water course within the catchment that's currently impounded by these dams, compared with 594 kilometres of water course in the catchment. Okay, so it's not a big impact, it's a relatively small area. But that's still not to take away from the fact that if you're farming that land, it's causing you a conflict. So just coming on to why and where beavers build dams, I suspect that you're probably all very familiar with this. But this is a sequence of slides taken from our enclosure. So this is over on the other side of Devon, in the fenced site, and there was no open water when we put the beavers into this site back in 2011. It was pretty much dry, there was a small channel running through the middle of the area. Um, and if we put beavers here without a fence, they would inevitably have just moved downstream to find deep water. But because they were held in this area with a fence, they were forced to create deep water. This is so that they've got that security. They're looking for depth of water so that they can disappear from predators, so that they can have underwater entrances to their burrows and lodges. And so they were forced to engineer this site. And since then, we've been mapping the changes uh, on an annual basis. And this is what the site looked like at the beginning. So we've got a tiny trickle of a watercourse running through the site from right to left. The pool in the middle is the release pond that we built them back in 2010, 2011, when we put the animals in. Um, but that's how it looked. Within a year, within 10 months, they'd already started building dams. So that's what the black lines are, are these dams. Obviously that creates pools, so you can see the amount of standing water behind those dams. But the other thing to notice is the canal network. So as well as, um, as, well as the pools, you've then got these, um, these canals that connect the pools together allowing them to move between these sites, and also laterally, so away from the watercourses, allowing them to explore and exploit the territory further away from the main channel. 2013, another year on, and this has really becoming quite a complex site. Um, the top dam, the top black line, is about 30, 35 metres in length by this point. It's still only about a foot, foot and a half tall. It's not a particularly big dam. It's just very long, and it's mostly this one made of mud with some sticks binding it all together. 2014, so the beavers bred in 2013, so we get a, a step change in behaviour as the number of animals increases. 2015, 2016, and then the last one we had done was 2017. So that gives you an idea of the dramatic impact that these animals can have on really what was a very small watercourse. We call them a keystone species because of this. This is the impact they have, and this is going to benefit a whole <laughs> range of other species as well. So the amphibians have gone through the roof. We've had a whole range of new, new species recorded here now as well. It's just become a, an absolute haven for wetland wildlife. But the other thing that we've been studying here is the hydrology and the water quality. So this is the, uh, the equipment that's been installed by the University of Exeter. So this is Richard Brazes' team who's done um, most of the research really on the hydrology and, um, and water quality across the country now. Um, this bit the pit does two things, it measures flow at this location, and as you can see it's not a big water course, this really is a, a very small headwater stream. So this is at the bottom of the site, this is flow coming out. It also takes water quality samples, so that big barrel on the right hand side is where it stores water quality samples during a flood event. And that's when you tend to get your water quality problems, your diffuse pollutants are washed off the land during high flow events. And this is what the data looks like. So the red stars are where these V-notches are. So they're measuring the flow at the top and measuring the flow at the bottom. You get a bit of rainfall and you get at the top you get this blue line. So this is the water flow coming in at the top of the site. And then by the time that flood peak has been through that sequence of 13 dams and is then measured again at the bottom, you get the red line. Okay, so you've got a really distinctive difference in the hydrograph over this 180 metre length of watercourse. Now, it's too early at the moment to extrapolate this up to a catchment scale, but you can imagine that if you've got beavers in all of your headwater streams and all of your headwaters look like this, the impact on communities living 
within the floodplains downstream really could be quite significant. The other side of the, um, the other piece of research has been the water quality side of it, and the bottles on the left hand um, side show um, the picture really better than anything else. The left hand one is the upstream, the right hand one is the downstream. So that's the suspended sediment levels, and the suspended sediment is where your phosphates and your nitrates are bound. So by allowing that suspended sediment to settle out into those pools, you're taking out the phosphates and the nitrates. So you're having, even during high flow events, you're having a significant impact on the, on the water quality. Now, the, the dams back over on the River Otter are very varied. Five minutes, okay. Um, so we have um, a very much a, a high energy stream where we've had some really impressive dams built, and you can see that one on the right hand side there. Um, but these are much more dynamic features. These really aren't, um, these aren't, aren't necessarily permanent dams. They come and go, often the tops wash off them, they become smaller. Sometimes in doing so, they transform the, the channel itself. So from a relatively incised deep channel that you can see on the left hand side, when that dam is washed through, you get a very different channel. So you're getting a raising of the bed level, you're getting some lovely gravels created, and this is now perfect spawning for, for trout and salmon, potentially. So it's this dynamism, bringing this dynamism back into the system is potentially having huge benefits for the aquatic ecology and particularly the fish populations. But clearly dams are going to cause conflicts, and they certainly have caused conflicts in the, in the otter catchment, particularly in these um, heavily modified watercourses um, and ditch systems. This is one example. And clearly dams in the wrong places, like in these urban streams, are really going to cause problems. You know, they're going to, they could exacerbate flooding if they're, not, um, if they're not managed. This is where another piece of research by the University of Exeter is quite relevant. So this is the dam capacity modelling that Hugh Graham has been working on. Um, again, he's part of Richard's team. And this is trying to show where in the river catchment beavers are most likely to build dams. And they've also tested this out in the River Tay as well. The main thing to notice here is that the main stem of the river, where there's plenty of deep water already, you just don't expect to see any dam building. The beavers don't need to build dams in those areas. They've got plenty of stability. There's no real need for them to build dams at all. But if you go up into the headwaters and some of the tributaries, you can see the blue and the green areas. And those are the areas where damming is most likely. And if you zoom in, the same data set on the left-hand side, you can see what that looks like um, at, a, at a field scale. And what they've then done is overlaid the infrastructure, and so you get the map on the right, which shows where your conflicts are most likely to be. And that allows you to, uh, to dedicate resources to where um, conflict resolution might be most useful. So it ties in where you, where you have critical infrastructure, but also where you might expect to see more damming. So again, a really useful bit of data. Okay, so at the end of the trial, uh, in March 2020, the government needs to make a clear decision regarding the future of the beavers on the River Otter and the adjacent catchments into which they are anticipated to spread if they were permitted. They also need to clarify the legal status in England as well. So we've had Michael Gove down uh, on a fact-finding uh, tour. It seems very unlikely that he will be the person making the decision in March 2020, however. <laughs> Um, in January 2020, we will be producing, or the Science and Evidence Forum will be publishing the main findings of the, um, the monitoring work. So that's a piece of work that's just being done now, it's just being pulled together now. But the other thing that we are, we've just completed is a, a production of a beaver management strategy framework for the River Otter catchment for after 2020, if beavers are permitted to remain. So this is a piece of work that's being funded by DEFRA, and it includes the usual uh, suspects, so Derek and Rasheen are in the room there, you can probably just about make out. Um, but a whole range of other stakeholders, so NFU, CLA. Um, it's really designed to be a very uh, interactive working group, and has come up with um, a strategy framework which we are um, about to publish. A few of the key things that come out of that. Firstly, it's imperative that a beaver management group is established for the catchment that oversees the implementation of this plan. And that central government funding is essential for that. 
So you have lots of potential benefits from dealers, and that's great for society, but you do have to manage those conflicts. Okay, and that needs to be done <coughs> proactively. So there needs to be core central government funding for that. Financial support for land and property owners is also essential to innate, to allow more space for water alongside watercourses. This is a lovely example. We've got a, a watercourse running through the middle of this site from bottom right to top left, and the beavers built a dam on that. And the landowner here allowed the creation of this beautiful wetland in response. So it pushed water out of the channel onto the surrounding bit of wetland. And that's brilliant because we had a very supportive landowner. But not all landowners, certainly without financial support, would be prepared to do that. The other advantage of that, as well as creating this new wetland, and this is the dam on the left-hand side here, is that it's allowed the creation of new bypass channels. So conflicts with fish have also been resolved here because the fish are able to go up with bypass channels around the main dam. If you confined the watercourses to or the water to that original watercourse and then put this dam in place, then potentially you've got an obstruction to fish passage. But if you allow the watercourse to have space and spill out back onto the floodplain, you resolve that. We're also saying it's essential that high quality and pragmatic one-to-one -one advice and support is available to land and property owners. And that allows them to deploy a whole suite of different engineering solutions to deal with problems, fencing trees, flow devices, beaver deceivers, etc. So really, again, really critical, and there needs to be funding for that as well. And the local management group also has to be resourced to deliver education and awareness raising programs. So we talked about myths already. There are a huge, around, huge number of myths associated with beavers. Actually, if you deal with some of those myths, people really do relax. It's amazing. You see people relax physically when you deal with some of the myths that they've got in their heads about beavers. And we've had an insatiable demand for information about beavers. We've done 350 odd events in the last four years, um, and most of those are reactive. So it's people coming to us saying, can you give us a talk, can you give us a walk, can we see the sites? So there is, there is certainly the demand for that accurate information. Okay, I think we're getting to the end now. So just a quick thank you for, um, for funding from these organisations. Unlike the Scottish trial, we didn't have any government funding at all for the, um, for the River Otter Beaver trial. Um, government saw themselves as a regulator of the, of the trial rather than as a, as a partner. Um, having said that, we've now had the DEFRA funding for this post, the development of the post-trial management, which is very welcome. Um, and I think that's all. Thank you very much.